mierda! ¡Bonita! This video was posted by Amanda Serrano herself via her social media, landing a peach of a body shot on what was a sparring partner that was reduced to a moaning grimace. She was hurt. And to that, Amanda's old buddy, Sky Nicholson, had some harsh criticisms saying, imagine being an accomplished world champion, quote unquote, empowering women and pushing for equality and change, flexing a sparring video, dropping a girl who looks like she's never laced up a pair of gloves before. It seems to me that Sky's just using this to further fan the flame and further fan the rivalry between them, but for all the discussions about the fight, a fight between Sky Nicholson and Amanda Amanda Serrano, based on Amanda's itinerary, I don't get the sense that fight happens. Amanda's got maybe one or two more fights in the sport of boxing than she means to go back into mixed martial arts by year's end. Thus, I don't think Sky is a priority to Amanda in spite of whatever Sky has to say. No, it's what happens after Amanda goes into the octagon. That's where things are going to get interesting because Amanda might so decide to vacate the remaining titles she still holds beyond this year and a new champion, a new crop of champions may sprout up. In my previous video, we talked about how Germany's own Nina Menke, who Amanda is about to fight, she's ranked at number one with three of the four sanctioning bodies. And it's the people ranked behind her you want to look at because if those people, if those girls can hold their positions beyond the Serrano versus Menke fight, they may become the next wave of champions at 126. Jaleta Marjanovic, former champion of Canada, and Daniela Bermudez of Argentina, a multi-weight champion. Based on where they are now, and what fights are already en route, what fights have already been made, it's conceivable that Jelena and Daniela, if they can hold their positions, their current positions in the ranks, they may become champions in this calendar year. And the relevance of that to Sky Nicholson is while Sky might not get that fight with Amanda Serrano, she might get to fight these other fighters that if she wants to become an undisputed champion herself at some point, she might have to go through Jelena, she might have to go through Daniela. Now, when it comes to Jelena, when it comes to a Jelena Marjanovic fight, I think Sky would outclass her. I think Sky's too fast and too agile, too mobile for Jelena Marjanovic at this point, who has so clearly lost the step based on what I saw in her last two or three fights. So I'm comfortable with Sky beating Jelena Marjanovic should Jelena become a champion. It's the Daniela Bermudez fight that's really intriguing, the contrasting styles. Sky Nicholson, the pure boxer, versus Daniela Bermudez, the pressure fighter. We talk about it all the time, how pressure fighters tend to give pure boxers a lot of problems. What's noteworthy is even though Daniela Bermudez has the right base style for the job, in many ways, she is a naturally smaller fighter than Sky Nicholson. And she used to campaign as low as super flyweight held a title there She held the title at super flyweight at bantam and at super bantam currently She's ranked at feather and while she is by and large a more experienced fighter than sky nicholson And she has the right base style for the job the caveat is that she is naturally smaller and noticeably slower even though pressure fighters like daniela 
usually get the best of pure boxers like Sky, there are rare instances based on the differences and the nuances of each individual fighter. Sometimes, sometimes the pure boxer wins. It's rare, but it happens. That would be a really intriguing fight for Sky Nicholson down the line because I reiterate, I don't think she's gonna get the Amanda Serrano fight. And I don't think Amanda's gonna be in the sport that much longer. These two fighters, these two former champions, Jelena Marjanovic, Daniela Bermudez, they may become people of interest to Sky Nicholson if they end up being champions at this weight like she's about to. So that's just something to keep your eye on. Beyond the Nicholson versus Mafood fight that has been ordered and beyond the Serrano versus Menke fight. In men's junior middleweight news, Israel Madrimov versus Magomed Kurbanov. Junior middleweight bout set reportedly for the WBA title. Jermel Charlo's old title. Jermel, who I told you, I think he's all but done as a junior middleweight. After the Brian Castaño rematch, I told you, I didn't expect him to come back to 154. No. Israel Madrimov is expected to have more than one fight this year and for his next one to be a mandatory title challenge. The latter will prove true, though even that part isn't as he previously envisioned. BoxingScene.com has confirmed that plans are in place for Uzbekistan's Madrimov to next face Russia's Magomed Kurbanov. Representatives from both camps confirmed to boxing scene that a deal was reached between the top two WBA junior middleweight contenders, though a date and a location was not yet set. Who's gonna promote it? Both are under the impression that the fight will be contested for the WBA junior middleweight title. Boxing scene was not able to confirm whether or not Jermel Charlo has formally relinquished the title as this goes to publication. Madrimov, who is co-promoted by Matchroom Boxing and World of Boxing, has been the mandatory challenger for more than a year, but was forced to wait out the rotation for his turn at the division's top prize. Houston's Chirlo spent the first half of 2023 healing from a broken hand injury before he committed to a two-division jump to challenge Canelo Alvarez. Jim Melchalo has already dropped the WBO and IBF titles. The WBO, that went to Tim Zhu. And the IBF is rumored to be contested between Bakram Mertazaliev and Jack Cole K, and it's looking more and more like the WBA title will be the next title that Jermel Charlo must relinquish. And with that, so goes the stronghold that the PBC once had at 154 pounds. They used to have the run of the place, but based on where the titles are going, not anymore. The WBA had not yet ordered Charlo versus Madrimov or any other mandatory fight with several contenders awaiting their marching orders at the start of this year. Charlo also holds the WBC title, which doesn't currently carry a mandatory challenger. I vaguely recall a story a few weeks ago indicating that Bohachuk versus Fundora, the winner of that fight would go on to become the WBC's mandatory challenger, though obviously that fight hasn't happened yet. And that's gonna be an entertaining fight if they make it. That's for the WBC. As it pertains to the WBA, Either Matchroom or World of Boxing could be promoting this show. World of Boxing, a Russian-based promotional outfit, Magomed Kurbanov being a Russian-based fighter, I could see either one of those promotional outfits at the helm of this fight, of this promotion. Even though we don't have the official word on whether or not Jermel actually vacated the WBA title, Madrimov and his team have proceeded as if the belt is available for their side to negotiate with other boxers. His handlers were previously in talks with JJ Metcalf, who turned down the fight due to the lack of preparation time for a targeted date in January. Is it me or does Madrimov kind of resemble Golovkin? A little. Is Rael Madrimov and Magomed Kurbanov, those are both action guys. They're both action fighters. So a fight between them will be a fan-friendly fight and a fight of some significance as it could be for the full WBA title. The landscape is changing at 154, and I think it's changing for the better. You're seeing a lot more movement at 154 than 160. Usually it's the other way around. 160 historically is known as one of the glamour weights, but it's 154. Some good fights. Bohachuk versus Fundora. Madrimov versus Kurbanov, and whoever Tim Zhu ends up fighting, as well as the upcoming Xander Zayas versus Patrick Teixeira fight. 
like 154 is shelling out some very good fights some interesting fights a lot more than 160. Now both Madrimov and Kurbanov only saw action once last year, so they could both stand to be a lot busier, and I think that they both intend to be this calendar year, kicking it off with what could be this WBA title fight. Madrimov and Kurbanov share a common opponent in Michael Soro. They've both shared the ring with that guy, but you could argue that Magomed Kurbanov comparatively has fought better fighters than Israel has. He's been in there with a former champion in Patrick Teixeira, another former champion in Liam Smith, with the caveat being that his win over Liam Smith was controversial. A lot of people felt that Liam should have got the nod, he should have got the decision, and the only reason he didn't was because he was on Russian soil. That's why it's important to know who's promoting this thing and where is it going down, because if it's World of Boxing promoting it, that means it's going to be in Russia. Cool. Whereas if Matchroom's promoting the show, there's a greater probability that the fight might happen in a more neutral location? It's a title fight. It's supposed to be a title fight. And if it's for a title, then it matters. Providing further indication of what I already knew, what I already told you, that Jermel Charlo is done, done at 154. Anybody that was waiting for him to drop back down and wait and maybe take on Terrence Crawford. Nope. I told you that wasn't going to happen. And I told you... After going up to 168 and making whatever money he made losing to Canelo Alvarez, he's not going to be in a rush to come back. And least of all, he's not going to be in a rush to make 154. He hasn't made that weight in over a year. If and when he comes back, he might come back at 160 at middleweight. He's done at junior middle and perhaps it's for the best the proliferation of fighters the proliferation of talented fighters we're seeing at 154 it's good tim zoo xander zayas magomed kurbanov israel madrimov ain't virgil ortiz making his junior middleweight debut this weekend sort of it's more of a middleweight debut per reports it's being fought at a catch weight of 156 two pounds above 154 which is the junior middleweight limit in any event what i'm seeing at 154 well i like what i see i like like the future of this division and I like this fight. Madrimov versus Kurbanov, that's an action fight between two action fighters, so I don't think it'll disappoint. Let's see if they make it. I don't know. That could be ten rounds of war. One of them's getting knocked out. And you you gotta you, you gotta hope for boxing's sake again that it's not Anthony Joshua. Because that does disrupt the apple cart in lots of ways. But who knows? This is this is what it's about. Gareth A. Davies, a big Tyson Fury fan, a huge Tyson Fury supporter, wants to leave it to the imagination, deliberately. He wants to leave it to the imagination who would win an Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou fight because if he says it outright, if he says he feels that Anthony would stop Francis where Tyson Fury didn't, that would be the second time that Anthony has upstaged him. And he needs to for the good name and reputation of the sport that was besmirched when Tyson Fury stunk out the place against Francis Ngannou late last year. I told you I was not never settled on Fury being this era's number one heavyweight. I was never settled on him being this era's premier heavyweight because even though he beat Vladimir Klitschko and took those three alphabet titles from him and the Ring Magazine title, he absconded for two and a half years and he relinquished all the belts that he won. In his absence, a new crop of champions sprouted up and he didn't fight all of them. And in a very general sense, Tyson Fury has been consistently inconsistent throughout his career. The gift decision over John McDermott, never getting around to facing his domestic rival, David Price, back when David was a highly touted fighter, pulling out of the Ustinov fight, pulling out of the Pulev fight. He beat Klitschko, which is worth some credit, but he absconded for two and a half years after that. And when he came back, all he really did was beat Deontay Wilder, fight Deontay Wilder for about, what, three or four years? Beating Wilder makes him number one? What about all the other fighters, all the other guys at the weight? It's not like Wilder fought them. It's not like Wilder beat them. Thus, I was never settled on Tyson Fury being number one or being this era's premier heavyweight. If he beats Usyk and becomes undisputed, then I will concede that he's number one. All of us will have to. But until he does, that number one spot is up for grabs. As it pertains to Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou and the virtue of that fight, well, there is an obvious financial incentive in it for both Anthony Joshua and Francis Ngannou, but 
in the greater scheme of things and for the greater good, for the sport, somebody's got to redeem the damage that Tyson Fury did to it and its reputation going out there and stinking out the joint opposite the ring of novice, a guy who never had a professional boxing match. You're intended to be the number one heavyweight in the sport of boxing and you got sat on your ass by a novice, which gave rise to a lot of talks in the MMA community. Charles Sonnen said that boxing is a fake sport. Sean O'Malley took it upon himself to start calling out boxers. And how many people in both the MMA and boxing community did you see saying that Francis should have got the nod, Francis should have got the decision unofficially, he won the fight. A novice is not supposed to do well, look that good, opposite the ring what's supposed to be the number one heavyweight in the world. But against Tyson Fury, he did. And now the sport needs redeeming. It needs redemption. It needs repair. And Anthony can be the one to repair it. Because I don't think for a second Francis Ngannou goes 10 or 12 rounds with Anthony Joshua. Anthony stops him. Which, at least in theory, could set the stage for a Joshua versus Fury showdown. I myself don't have Tyson Fury winning the Usyk fight, but let's say that he does. Let's say that he wins, and let's say Anthony takes on Francis Ngannou. Let's say he beats him. Well, if they both take care of business, that sets up a super fight between them. A super fight I'm sure the Saudis would love. Would pay for. Eddie Hearn was quoted as saying, so right now we have three fights that we're in discussions for. Our aim, and we've expressed this, is to fight the winner of Fury versus Usyk. That's all we want to do. Obviously, there's Philippe Pergovic out there for the world heavyweight title. There's a Francis Ngannou fight out there, which would be absolutely colossal, and it would. Bigger than the Fury fight. The Fury fight bombed at the box office. The Anthony Joshua fight wouldn't. Joshua versus Ngannou is bigger than Fury versus Ngannou. Worldwide, it only did about 400,000 buys. There was no real angle to make that fight. The endeavor was ill-timed because these crossover MMA boxing matches, I mean, we already got the granddaddy of them in the Floyd Mayweather versus Conor McGregor fight. And when you consider that Tyson Fury is not the boxing what Floyd was, and Francis is not the MMA, what Connor was, you're only gonna sell so many pay-per-view buys, and especially when what people really wanted Fury to do was fight Usyk. The silver lining is, Francis Ngannou performing as well as he did set the stage for Anthony to come in. Much to the chagrin of Tyson Fury's fans, Gareth A. Davies among them, who would prefer to leave it to the imagination what would happen when I think, underneath it all, we all know what would happen. Anthony would stop him. He just doesn't want to admit it because if he does, he has to acknowledge that once again, Tyson Fury has been upstaged. So maybe he's not as good as you've made him out to be. You were the ones carrying on, saying that he's number one in this era, and not just number one in this era, but the greatest the sport has ever seen. It was nauseating. Just so that he can be embarrassed by a novice, not just embarrass himself, but embarrass the sport. Anthony Joshua can repair the damage that Tyson Fury has done to the sport of boxing by fighting Francis, beating Francis, and stopping Francis. And I think he can make the fight.